welcome to Lifestyle Magazine. I'm your host, Roy Ice. On today's show, we're gonna meet two amazing people with kids in the center of their hearts. Phil Rigo felt called to found an orphanage in Haiti. Jeanette Yoff, a foster and adopted child herself, founded a support center in honor of her biological mother. Both strive to support transitions to happy and healthy permanent homes. This is Lifestyle Magazine with your hosts, Roy Ice, Mike Tucker, Dr. Sharmini Long, Obi OBDK, and Lionel Lamount. Our guest is Jeanette Yo. She is the founder of Celia Center, clinical director of Yoth Therapies. And we are happy that you are here today, Jeanette. Oh, by the way, you've authored a couple of books that you shared with me. The first one is Working with Traumatized Children, Teens, Families in Foster Care and Adoption. And also a one-person play, a one-woman play, What's Your Name, Who's Your Daddy? Um, so you've, you've had quite a journey to begin to work in this particular area. So um, what was your journey to get here? Well, thank you for having me. Well, I was born in New York City. I lived with my family of origin for the first 17 months of my life. My mother was an Argentinian woman from Argentina, Buenos Aires. She was an accomplished dancer, and she came to the United States, New York, to work with the Martha Graham Dance Company. And she didn't speak English. She met my father, who was a lineman for New York City Telephone, and they fell in love. And they got married, they had me. My mother became pregnant with my brother. And during her second pregnancy, she had tremendous stressors. Uh, her mother was dying. Uh, she was, didn't speak very much English. She didn't know how to reach out for help. And she had significant mental health issues. And at that time, it was deemed unsafe for me to stay with her. So I did enter the foster care system. And my father did not feel that he could parent two children under the age of three. So I went into a loving foster family. I stayed with them for six and a half years. And while I was there, they did attempt Jewish childcare, uh, did attempt to reunify with me and my brother with family in Argentina, but it was just too complicated. And so I remained in foster care. Then they transitioned me into a, an adoptive family that was very loving. And I was adopted, and I have two adopted siblings, and we also fostered another child who was reunified with her mother. This sounds like it would have been a very hard um, experience to go through as a child. How did you cope with that? Yes, it was very hard. Uh, I had a lot of anxiety. I cried a lot. My parents were confused. They didn't understand that I was a child that came to them that had a full history, a, a full life, and they didn't know how to, to manage that. And so uh, luckily I lived next door to a dance studio and I did not know that my mother was a dancer. So I didn't, wasn't able to connect the dots, but I loved dancing. So dancing gave me a sense of community and being with other kids and gave me a sense of normalcy. And so being in the dance studio and, and doing gymnastics and performing really allowed me to become more interested in the performing arts, which I loved. And I got involved with theaters. I performed in uh, ensemble theater comp studios and productions, and I just loved it. And it was easier for me to be other people. It allowed me to have this false self because being me was just so hard. And so that allowed me to cope. And in that, I took it upon myself to consider pursuing a career in the arts. My parents weren't too happy about that because it's a tough life. But I said, I want to do it. It was, I was compelled to do it. I received a bachelor in fine arts uh, in Pace University in Manhattan. And then I decided, well, I'm going to be a theater actress. And I did theater. And then I decided, well, I'm really going to go for it. And I moved to Los Angeles. And when I moved to Los Angeles, I became involved with a theater company. And the theater company encouraged 
us to write as actors, write original work. So I wrote a scene, that makes me emotional, about a child who auditions for a family. And everybody was blown away and moved, and they said, what is this? Yeah. And I said, well, it's my life. It's what I felt like growing up, that I always had to be something for somebody else and be wanted, be lovable. And so in writing that play, it really became this catharsis for my life. And it ended up, I wrote a full one woman play called What's Your Name, Who's Your Daddy? And I performed it for nine months in Los Angeles for adoption agencies, foster agencies. And I realized, wow, I have this insight and experience and I can do something with it. And just working with therapists and social workers and just realizing that I could be like the social worker that was, for me, helping me transition from one family to the other, Barbara Horowitz. I could be that to a child. And so I took it upon myself to study psychology, let acting go, and work with children. So many people in the helping therapies, uh, helping professions get there because of their own pain. And so now you've decided to specialize in this particular area with uh, adoptive children and children who are displaced for one reason or another. Yes, I do. And so I received my master's in clinical psychology. I started a private practice. I worked predominantly with children and families connected by foster care and adoption. I then realized that families needed more support. I then uh, started some support groups to create community. I also wanted to know who was out there like me. And then I also did research as now a therapist working in the field, how do I help children like me? And I started thinking, well, what did I need when I was a right. child? Well, let's, let's skip right there right now. We're about out of time for this segment, but can you tell me what are the basic needs that, pe that children in adoption and foster care need, have? Yes, so there are seven core issues, and these are vulnerabilities for anyone who's experienced foster care and adoption. And this was coined by Sharon Roja, a pioneer in the field of adoption. We experience all adoption is created through loss. Then there's rejection. Then there's the guilt and shame of having lived this experience. Then there is grief, and this is a lifelong processing of grief. We don't get over it, we're continuously working through it. And then there's identity. We're trying to figure out where do we come from, who are we, and where, would, where do we belong? And then there's intimacy issues. Who can I trust? Where do I feel secure and stable in a relationship when I've had these multiple placements? Mm -hmm. And then there is feeling of the last task is feeling a sense of mastery and control in your life when all of these choices were made for you and you didn't have a say in the matter as Thank a child. So this much. is such good information, Jeanette, and we really want to delve more into it. We're going to have to take a little bit of a break. We'll be back in just a few minutes with Phil and Jeanette together. We're back with Phil and Jeanette. Phil, can you talk to us about the coping mechanisms that you have seen the children use in the orphanage that you're working in? Well, um, you do have identity problems. Kids are, you're finding from the street and in the trash piles and, and you're trying to bring in uh, a family atmosphere. And that's been a big struggle for me, uh, you know, rejection. You know, when the baby cries, they cry to the wall, they cry to a tree, they have no, no mother, no father. That's been a big battle for me. Hmm. Jeanette, you founded the nonprofit uh, Cilia Center in honor of your birth mother. Tell me about that. Yes, so working with families connected by foster care and adoption, I found that we needed community. Other parents needed to know that they were not alone in their experience because they need a lot of support. And I also wanted to learn who was out there like me still dealing and coping with all of these core issues. So I wanted to bring us together as a community. So I started Celia Center. And 
Celia Center's goal is to bring the constellation, that's all members that are connected by adoption, that's the first family of origin, that's adoptees, and that's adoptive parents. And we all sit together in a support group and we hear each other's point of view so we can have compassion because there's a lot of negative stigma about birth families and there's a lot of negative stigma about youth and foster youth and adoptees. So I wanted us to just bridge that gap form community, we have mental health conferences, we have arts festivals, adopting resilience, fostering the art of creativity to bring out, transform healing, and so that we can all as a community support each other in our growth. It's interesting, we've asked two different questions of the mm -hmm. two of you to start this seg segment, and the answers came back really pretty much the same. We're, we need connectivity for children. Children need someone in their lives, someone who cares, mm -hmm. who, who loves them, who will nurture them, and provide a resource for them. Phil, I, I'm impressed by how, uh, how you're trying to do that in Haiti as well. Uh, put people in these children's lives in order to give them someone who loves them. Yes, it is. Uh, it's a battle. I'm not qualified for it, but um, you know, when God sends you down there, you kind of, you know, you're, you're not a dentist, but you're pulling teeth. You know, you got a child that's, you know, has got problems. You're trying to identify with the problems, but you know, I think God makes up the difference in you. Phil, what can people do to help support the Feed My Lambs ministry? We have a home that could accommodate uh, 22 people at a time, and we feed them, and then we have a project. So that's one way you could uh, help us. And the other way is through sponsorship. Uh, $252 put a kid in school all year. And we give a uniform, backpack, school supplies, a year of education. And the other way, we, have a, we created a, a calendar that we sell to uh, people, and that provides food for the community of the school, 700 kids, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Jeanette, we just asked Phil a question about what we can do to help. How about with the uh, foster care system, adoption system? What, what can we do to help? Well, we can be respectful in understanding that all of these core issues, it's the invisible wound in adoption. We are struggling internally. It's not, our behavior is not what's wrong with us. It's about what's happened to us. So have compassion. And let's erase the negative stigma that, you know, we're not unwanted children. Most parents want their children. They don't give up on their children. They love them. What they give up on is the system. And they don't know how to maneuver and navigate the system like my own mother. So let's erase this negative stigma. You know, just the other day, I had someone come up to me and they said, I just learned you were in foster care. Oh my God, that, wow, I should be in a puddle of tears. <laughs> like I was raised with love and there were people who supported me. So please, we are not, we want your empathy, not your sympathy. And I think another piece is children don't come to you with a blank slate. They have a life history. They have an ancestral history they have a family and we need to honor their ancestral heritage and that's their racial ethnic cultural roots because that's a big part of who they are and if we don't they can have what's like what's called identity confusion and not be able to know how to show up authentically in their authentic true self so we want to honor all these parts and be a source of support and compassion I, I hear what you're saying, and, and as you do, my, my thoughts go to a man who works with this team, so integral to the creation of the show. His name is Chauncey. He too was adopted, and I, I've heard him say those very things you're talking about, about his own idea. He wrote a book inside, entitled, So That's Who I Am, when he finally figured it out, put the pieces together. But knowing that and helping children discover that part of their identity, you say is really key here. Yes, it gives us a foundation of who we are to spring off of. And really, we need to take pride in who we are because our self-esteem does become compromised. When we're placed into another family, we feel like there's something wrong about us. I myself as a kid, had a, I have a birthmark on my leg. And I used to think, this is why my parents didn't want me. Oh, no see. one told me my story. Kids need to know their story. And so I created, just recently for November was National Adoption Awareness Month, I created an animation for children called What is Adoption to help them understand how an adoption is formed, oh, how wonderful. a family is formed, and how 
What are the many reasons why we can't live with our families so children don't blame themselves? We're going to put more resources on our website. we got a break now, and we'll be back with more with Roy in just a moment. Both of our wonderful guests today clearly exemplify what we encourage people to do within our aware key number five, existence. You were made for a purpose, and that purpose is to, in some way, find people in need that you can serve and help to make their lives better. If you're curious about your purpose, take a look at some of the segments of society that you are naturally passionate about and ask the question, how can I serve and help them live their best life possible today?